my paper is in part um, a response to a reaction that I got from my friends in the English-speaking world on many occasions. Uh, and people always tell me, this is not history of philosophy, it's history of ideas. And I'm really tired of this kind of objection. <laughs> So what I'm trying to do in this paper is to argue that one can go very historical and maybe still make a point that might be interesting from a contemporary perspective. So um, in Mary Estelle's essayistic output from the period between 1694 and 1700, there is a not very extensive but thematically interrelated series of remarks about flattery. Unsurprisingly, since gender relations are recurrent themes in her essays, much of what she says about flattery has to do with the structure of gender roles. Surprisingly, however, while Estelle's views on other varieties of male domination have received close consideration by her commentators, her analysis of the influence of male flattery on the formation of female gender roles has not received the attention that it deserves. To understand why Estelle's remarks on flattery deserve attention, not just from a historical point of view, it will be helpful to start by considering some aspects of what is perhaps the most sophisticated contemporary analysis of the vices associated with flattery, one developed by Yuval Elon and David Haidt. As Elon and Haidt argue, what makes flattery more interesting than other cases of deception is the fact that flattery is closely connected with faults of character, both of the flattery and the flatterer. In particular, they argue that it is closely connected with the phenomena of self-deception and impaired self-respect. Based on some ideas in Aristotle, Elon and Haidt distinguish between two kinds of flattery, obsequious flattery and manipulative flattery. As they characterize it, obsequious flattery is an attempt to create some personal relationship in order to partly overcome a hierarchical gap. It is partially sincere and does not seek material benefit, but only personal attention and appreciation. The paradigmatic case of this kind of flattery is the one um, by an unhappy lover. Uh, by contrast, in manipulative flattery, the flatterer acts with cool design, aiming at achieving a particular favor or personal benefit as a consequence of the favorable attitude the flattery would presumably develop towards her. The paradigmatic case of flattery of this kind is flattery by a politician. What is common to both types of flattery in Elon and Haidt's view is, um, uh, has been identified by Plato. Quote, Plato despises flattery for its being fake, that is, parasitical on truth. It has the appearance of reality but is illusory. It is based on the power of pleasure bestowed on the adversary rather than on her good. As Elon and Haidt elaborate on this idea, there are two ways in which a commendatory utterance can be parasitical on truth. First, it can make an ascription of a quality value by the flattery falsely or in an exaggerated way. Second, it can make a true ascription of a quality value by the flattery in an inappropriate context. Moreover, Elon and Hay note that the success of flattery as a manip manipulative act is conditioned by the partial lack of awareness on the part of the addressee of its nature. Obviously, this analysis of flattery is fascinating and contains many aspects that one will not find in Estelle. This holds in particular for the analysis of obsequious flattery, an issue not perceived as a problem um, by Estelle at all. Still, as far as the structure of manipulative flattery goes, there are two aspects in Estelle's analysis that go considerably beyond Elon and Hayes, although she does not use the term manipulative. 
The first of these aspects concerns the connection between male flattery and female self-esteem. Elon and Haidt touch upon these um, upon the issue of self-esteem only in passing, when they consider the relation between self-respect and self-esteem in the case of obsequious flattery. Also, in everyday language, there may be not be a sharp distinction between the term self-respect and self-esteem. Still, there are two clearly distinguishable concepts at work here, and in the by now classical article, David Sachs has proposed distinguishing self-respect from self-esteem, understanding self-esteem as an evaluation of one's own qualities, and self-respect as an attitude that demands that others' wishes and rights be respected. So the second connected aspect in which Estelle's analysis of manipulative flattery may go beyond Elon and Haidt's concerns with the, um, concerns the question of hierarchical relationships. Consider the following claim made by Elon and Haidt. Flattery is typically unidirectional, like the hierarchical relations on which it depends. Thus, although rulers, bosses, and teachers can complement their subjects, subordinates, and students, they cannot normally be said to flatter them. Flattery is made from a point of inferiority or need, material or psychological. So I think that's a very interesting claim, and maybe that's the, the crucial point where Estelle's treatment of flattery may go beyond what you have in this contemporary treatment. Certainly, Estelle considers situations in which men of lower social standing are using flattery in courting women of higher social standing. Still, the hierarchy involved in such situations have more than one dimension. In particular, Estelle is aware that the female self-image instrumentalized in manipulative flattery can itself be the outcome of male manipulation. In this sense, manipulative flattery itself is a way of establishing a hierarchy quite independently of the dimension of social standing because male flattery can serve to define the criteria according to which female self-esteem is formed. The act of manipulative flattery itself can imply a hierarchical order in which the one who defines the criteria of self-esteem holds a higher position than the one who is dependent on these criteria. And I will try to substantiate this suggestion in what follows. So, Elon and Haidt are clear that the vices of flattery are necessarily shared by, between flatterer and the flattery. They offer two examples of concrete character faults of the flattery, namely vanity and ambition. Estelle, too, notes that vanity is vice that makes women susceptible to flattery. As she explains, vanity is one of the vices that enable the workings of flattery because the flatterer can make use of the self-deception of the flattery. As she puts it, the mistaken self-love that reign in most of us, both men and women, that over good opinion we have of ourselves and desire that others should have of us, makes us swallow everything that looks like respect. Quote end. Still, just invoking the kind of self-deception involved in vanity may not suffice as an explanation for the success of flattery. After all, why should someone with an extraordinarily high opinion of herself be sensitive to the opinions of others? In fact, Elon and Haidt identify two additional factors that make people susceptible to flattery, and there are close parallels to these observations in Estelle. So, Elon and Tate characterize the first factor as follows. 
the vulnerability of the flattery is a consequence of the genuine importance and significance of the opinions of others, the significance and importance of honest compliments paid by competent persons. These facts mitigate the vice of the flattery in many instances. The vice is one of weakness, not of wickedness. Quote end. So they are very good writers. Likewise, Estelle observe, observes that the woman may listen to some, as he puts it, most disadvantageous proposals because they come attended with a seeming esteem. So it is the importance of genuine esteem and the similarity between flattery and genuine esteem that renders flattery so, so hard to resist. The second factor that leads people to be susceptible to flattery, Elon and Tate identify um, the lack of self-confidence and self-respect that leads to attaching too great a weight to the compliments of others. On first sight, this factor seems to be in tension with the high self-esteem connected with vanity. While Elon and Haidt do not discuss this apparent tension, Estelle offers some perceptive remarks how in gender relations both vanity and low self-esteem can be operative at the same time. As she puts it, and it is very great pity that they who are so apt to overrate themselves in smaller matters should where it most concerns them to know and stand upon their value, be so insensible of their worth. Quote end. Thus, the simultaneous presence of low and high self-esteem has to do with the different objects of self-esteem. The smaller matters versus qualities that constitute genuine personal value. As to the qualities that constitute genuine personal value, Estelle's views certainly are less surprising than the views of two philosophers whose work she mentions favorably, namely René Descartes and Henry Moore. Moore follows Descartes closely when he argues that the reason of self-esteem is the same as the reason of the esteem for others. As he puts it, veneration is the value we set upon a free agent that can, as we believe, do us either good or harm, and joined with the desire we have of putting ourselves in subjection to it. Quote end. By contrast, Estelle holds that without substantial standards of morality, there can be no coherent conception of justified self-esteem. For example, she, she remarks that the woman who has gone through the educational program envisaged by Estelle would value herself only on her virtue and consequently be most chary of what she esteems so much. As she argues, this is so because moral virtue contributes to the perfection of self. Consequently, she characterizes the kind of learning pursued by her project for female education will lead women to, quote, busy themselves in a serious inquiry after necessary and perfective truths, something which it concerns them to know and which tends to their real interest and perfection, quote end. This view of moral virtue as contributing to the perfection of human rationality, of course, is part and parcel of Estelle's Christian Platonism that is worked out most fully in her the Christian religion of 1705. So this is the general framework in which Estelle develops her um, conception of truly valuable personal qualities, those qualities that women are in danger of underestimating. But what are the so-called smaller matters, the qualities that women are in danger of overestimating that she has in mind? Consider the following passage. 
quote. Let us pride, let us learn to pride ourselves in something more excellent than in the invention of a fashion and not entertain such a degrading thought of our own worth as to imagine that our souls were given us only for the service of our bodies and that the best improvement we can make of these is to attract the eyes of men. We value them too much and ourselves too little. If we place, place any part of our desert in their opinion and don't think ourselves capable of nobler things than the pitiful conquest of some worthless heart. So she's also a very good author. <laughs> so this uh, passage articulates a close connection between overrating those qualities that are useful for attracting male attention and entertaining high self and entertaining high esteem for the men who pass judgment about the qualities of women. Moreover, Estelle points out that the high esteem for the male flatterer is an attitude that plays a role in explaining why flattery works. Quote, they know but little of human nature, who are not sensible what advances a well-managed flattery makes, especially from a person of whose wit and sense one has a good opinion. His wit at first recommends his flatteries, and these, in requital, set off his wit. Quote end. Taken together, these passages indicate why flattery can be detrimental to the genuine interests of women, because flatteries make use of both the high esteem for the flatterer and the high self-esteem for the qualities that attract, that attract male attention. They bring about low self-esteem for morally valuable personal qualities. This seems to be a way in which flattery can be related to a lack of self-respect, a way that does not figure in Aelon and Hate's account. In particular, it seems to be a way in which a kind of low self-esteem, low esteem for morally valuable personal qualities, can be connected with impaired self-respect. This is how Estelle may shed critical light on Sachs's view that low self-esteem never can be an obstacle to self-respect. Certainly, Sachs is right that low self-esteem can be compatible with an interest in protecting one's rights and wishes. But matters get more complicated if we shift to the combination of low self-esteem and high self-esteem concerning different objects that Estelle analyzes. Estelle is acutely aware that high self-esteem can hamper the pursuit of one's interests if it is not bound to realistic self-knowledge, knowledge of one's talents and interests. As she puts it, to know our strengths and neither to over nor underrate ourselves is one of the most material points of wisdom and which indeed we are most commonly ignorant of. Quote end. Self-knowledge, in her view, is not something merely descriptive, an empirical insight into the presence or absence of qualities that happen to be valued but rather normatively laden because it is bound to qualities that are inherently valuable. As she puts it, be so generous then, ladies, as to do nothing unworthy of you, so true to your interest as not to lessen your empire and, uh, and de depreciate your charms. End. As soon as the possibility of being deceived is built into the concept of self-esteem, Sachs' thesis that self-esteem cannot, cannot influence self-respect becomes difficult to uphold. If the self-knowledge involved in realistic self-esteem includes knowledge of one's genuine interests, in Estelle's view, interests concerning self-perfection, Erroneous self-esteem may include errors concerning one's genuine interests. 
And not knowing one's interests obviously impairs the capability to defend those interests and thus to uphold self-respect. Still, we do not have an explanation for why Estelle believes that unjustified self-love and self-esteem are more pressing problems for women than for men. Why is it that women encounter more profound obstacles to pursuing their interests? As we have seen, Estelle's answer has to do with the difficulties of, real, of reaching realistic self-esteem, but the problem of self-knowledge for her is closely connected with gender roles, in particular with high esteem for men who judge about women. Female vices, thus, are by no means vices devoid of a social, of a social basis. Misguided self-esteem for Estelle is not just a matter of female self-deception, rather it is shaped through what other people erroneously value, both for themselves and when they pass judgment of esteem about others. As her remarks indicate, she takes the standards according to which such, ju such judgments are formed as specifically male. This is suggested by her remark to the effect that women, quote, are blamed for that ill conduct they are not suffered to avoid and reproached for those faults they are in a manner forced into, quote end. One obvious way in which women are forced into the moral faults diagnosed by Estelle is connected with the kind of education imposed on girls. Um, so that's of course a big topic and maybe not such a um, surprising uh, aspect. However, closer to the issue of flattery, there is another educated, education-related issue. In Estelle's view, another way in which men undermine female self-esteem can derive from intellectual pursuits that pretend to be gender neutral, but in fact are part of a specifically, of specific, of specifically um, male gender roles. So she asks, would she, who by the regard she pays to wit, seems to make some pretenses to it, undervalue her judgment so much as to admit the scurrility and profane noisy nonsense of men? And of course, it's a rhetorical question. <laughs> Obviously, the answer is no. <laughs> but specifically, male conceptions of intellectuality threaten female self-esteem not only because such conceptions demand undeserved recognition from women, but also because such conceptions may directly interfere with the education of women. Now comes a long quotation. If they have a tolerable opinion of her sense, and not their vanity, but some better principle disposes them to be something out of the way and to appear more generous than the rest of their sex. They'll condescend, they, they'll, they'll condescend to dictate to her and impart some of their pre prerogative books and learning. Tis fit indeed that she should entirely depend on their choice and walk with the crutches they are pleased to, to lend her. And if she is furnished out with some notions to set her a prating, I should have said, said to make her entertaining and the fiddle of the company, her tutor's time was not ill bestowed. So I mean, you can hear the ironic um, undertone and um, I think the observation is that one way of pleasing male educators um, is to try to do well in specifically male intellectual activities. The benefit that the educators derive from such a situation is described as one of mere entertainment, while the position of the female student is described as one of dependence. B. 
being the fiddle of the company obviously involves some positive feedback from the educators, but obviously also it's the wrong kind of feedback. Um, not the kind of feedback that strengthens the interests of female students. This implication is brought out clearly in the following long passage. To help us to the knowledge of our own capacities, the informations of our friends, nay, even of our enemies, may be useful. The former, if wise and true, will direct us to the same course to which our genius points and the latter will industriously endeavor to divert us from it, and we can't be too careful that these don't disguise themselves under the specious appearance of the former, to do us an ill turn the more effectually. For it's not seldom seen that such a pretend great concern for us will press us on to such studies or ways of living as inwardly they know are unfit for no they, they, they press us on to such studies or ways of living as inwardly they know we are unfit for thereby to gratify their secret envy by diverting us from that to which our genius disposes and which Therefore, they have reason to suppose we would be excellent. Quote end. Thus, it is not only the shallowness of the education granted to girls that poses problems, also the imposition of male ideals of intellectual activity can lead to a downgrading of female self-esteem. Interestingly, this passage not only gives a diagnosis of what goes wrong when, when certain unjustified standards of male intellectuality influence the education of women, it also gives some hints as to how a moderate desire for the esteem of others could be put to work. As Estelle indicates, it is not only a matter of neither taking into account too little or too much input, input from others, Rather, we have to be able to judge which, income, which input comes from friends and which from enemies. Doing so requires the capacity of assessing whose advice is an expression of wisdom and truthfulness and whose advice is deceptive. And, as Estelle points out, truthfulness that offers the opportunity to improve upon the faults of character is exactly this quality that distinguishes the feedback of friends from flattery. So now we are back to the uh, starting point. So she says, for although true friends will endeavor to please in order to serve, their complaisance never goes so far as to prove injurious. The beloved fault is what they chiefly strike at, and this the flatterer always soothes. Quote end. Thus, mistaken female self-esteem not only arises out of spontaneous admiration for specifically male standards, for intellectual pursuits, but also out of the commun communicative agency of male educators who reinforce such standards through deceptive but positive feedback. Here we have a situation in which it is indeed easily conceivable that teachers use flattery with respect to their students. This is so because their positive feedback is deceptive, because the standards on which the feedback is based are contrary to the real talents of the female students. This, I think, is a particular instance of a more pervasive way in which female vices are, in a way, forced upon women through male communicative agency. And Estelle does not hesitate to characterize this agency as a kind of deception. As she says, if by reason of a false light or undue medium they choose a miss, theirs is the loss, but the crime is the deceivers. And crucially, for 
where the relevant kind of deception has to do with flattering. She, was, she writes, Nothing is in truth a greater outrage than flattery, the plain English of which is this. I have a very mean opinion both of your understanding and virtue. You are weak enough to be imposed on. If for, for nothing else, you'll serve at least as an exercise of my wit. And how much soever you well with my breath, tis I deserve the praise for talking so well on so poor a subject. We who make the idols are the greater deities. What end? So here we encounter the form of flattery that poses in, in, um, that poses as obsequious, but, but in fact is manipulative. Moreover, it is manipulative in a peculiar way because it does not just involve the pursuit of a selfish goal by praising whatever the flattery thinks praiseworthy. Rather, it is manipulative in defining the very qualities that are thought to be praiseworthy. The qualities praised by the manipulative flatterer posing as obsequious are not the qualities that women would value on the basis of justified self-knowledge. Rather, they are part of female role models set up by men and reinforced through repeated acts of male flattery. This is why Estelle expresses this kind of flattery in terms of a gendered version of the Baconian notion of idols. And of course, none of her readers could have been unaware of the implication that idols are something that we should try to get rid of. So the flatterer not only instrumentalizes the erroneous self-images of women, but the very act of flattery contributes to defining the criteria at work in such self-images. It is part of a strategy that poses as obsequious, but in fact expresses a superior hierarchical position of the male flatterer, since he is the one who claims the power of defining the criteria, the criteria for female self-images. Thereby, the female flattery is the one who is being deceived not only about the intentions of the flatterer, but also about the very foundations of her self-esteem. And in this way, the manipulative formation of female self-esteem through, flat through flattery in itself constitutes a form of male domination. So that's why I, I, I would like to suggest that what Estelle writes about something that one could call definitional flattery is really an aspect that dropped completely out of contemporary discussions about flattery. And in this sense, I'm, I mean, it's not just taking some words from a historical text and then simply think about what associations come to our mind and... I mean, that, this kind of activity that Bernard Williams described, that certainly doesn't make any sense. But what could make sense is really to look into um, complete arguments from historical texts and then think about whether these arguments could somehow complement arguments that you find about similar problems in contemporary texts. And if one pursues such a strategy, I think one can find something interesting in STEM. So, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas Blank. Some questions to these detailed and very profound uh, reflections on the social. Uh, uh, problems uh, connected to self-esteem and self Don't tell me, this is history of ideas. <laughs> Sarah, a question. Well, really, comments from questions. Comment. I think, first of all, as, as, I think this is a good illustration of the topic 
which comes to the fore when you start looking at what the women are talking about, which is not there. It's not, it's not really, maybe for some social philosophers it might have some distant relevance, but it's not a topic which leaps to mind as a major issue in, in, in philosophy. Um, Jeez, it, uh, th there's that, actually very little literature about yeah, yes. Plato so has written about yes, it, yes. Aristotle has written about yes. it, and then 2,000 years nothing, yes. more or less. Yes. And then this really fascinating article in Philosophy yes. and Phenomenological yes. Research. And I, I think this raises a whole lot of other questions. You know, is, is, is it just that we really haven't looked, and I guess you've looked, and it's just not been brought out? Or what is it about female philosopher's situation, her understanding of her the issues of her time, that she's going for this one? She's highlighting this because I think you're right. She, this is really very central for us now. I mean, you, you have in late scholastic ethics debate about esteem and honor and, and detraction. Um, so the, the, the more general problem of the justice of judgment about others, that never really um, went out of the philosophical picture. But these more gender specific questions of how does the, this vice, I mean the, the, the vice was well known but people thought it's ubiquitous and quite harmless because we, we use it all the time. I mean how, how bad can it be if we are doing it all the time? Well, precisely and, that, and my other comment was that, that of course when you go and look at the letters they write, that there are formulaic uh, expressions that are used and I made me think about Danvers Masham writing to Leibniz, and he, um, he compliments her on la pénétration des dames angloises. He sort of lots of, I mean, the, not the standard sort of form of flattery for, for a woman, but, but, but flattery for her as a, as a, as a philosopher, sort of, or at least having philosophical insight. And she, um, in these letters, you see her brush this aside. But she also plays this, makes this humility claim, you know, I'm only, she, she makes that okay by sort of saying, well, I'm only an ignorant woman, and please explain your wonderful theory to me. So I think there's a whole, there's a whole culture here of, of, um, of compliment, which <laughs> this, this feeds into, or this is part of. Um, and the compliments are not necessarily um, complicated put-downs, but they are, the, 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 this, is, this is a whole aspect of it. It's, yeah. it's, it's a really very complex issue. And, I, and, and you've brought that out. I think if you look at the, the, the style of the correspondences, I think that there's also a, a conventional aspect. Mm -hmm. So it's just what people expected. I mean, people of a certain social standing, um, they, they just were extremely polite. Well, yes, and these, these formulae, they survived. You know, only, it's only email that's really got this. Yeah. <laughs> You're sincerely. No one's sincere when they say that. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the, British, the British civil servant used to write, I am your most truly obedient servant. <laughs> when they were telling you you hadn't paid enough tax, yeah. you know. <laughs> But I, I think what Estelle has in mind is not really uh, th those flatteries that are part of politeness or, or, or yeah. formu formulae, but rather even very simple things like, you're a good dancer. Yes. And, but so, and she sees this implies some judgment like it's important to be a good dancer. So, I mean, it could be completely truthful, so this person is really a good dancer, but why is it mentioned? So I think this is the aspect. Yes, yes, that I quite this agree, but, yeah. but, but I think politeness, because of the culture of politeness itself is deceptive, because it, 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 it perhaps deludes us into thinking, well, these are not really, or, or I mean, perhaps, perhaps she has to point this out the more because it seems to be within that more innocuous sort of Yeah, I mean, politeness, I think, is a slightly different topic because there it's not really about making truth claims, but it's 
Yeah, but there is a, a, a huge debate, of course, about politeness. So Rousseau about really despises it, but other yeah. Enlightenment thinkers. Um, it's also about the basis on which you can discuss. Exactly. That. I mean, they they see well, they, you 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 should put questions of truthfulness aside and look at the function. So you, you give simply friendly signals and then people can connect with each other and communicate and that's important for establishing public reason and so on. So I think that, but that's a bit a, a different um, debate from the issue of flattery because there, um, I, 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 I don't disagree. I'm mm -hmm. just saying that, that, that they are in the same, no, with a wider, they're within the same, um, they belong in the same area, sort of, in the sense of that it's all part of the same culture. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that so the flattery of, as a The rules of politeness can, can deceive the woman into thinking mm -hmm. that this is, I mean, uh, uh, into not realizing the harmfulness mm -hmm. of what's, what's going on. And I think that's the interesting thing about her remarks about flattery, because she saw how harmful these seemingly innocuous practices can be. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think that's what, what we can get from yes. her. Yeah. Yeah. Is the, uh, not the question from the audience. So I would like to join yes. in now. You debate on flattery. Because as far as I have understood now this discussion, it is um, clear, as you have said, this is an innovative uh, principle that is, comes out with the history of women philosophers to see that our social reality is categorized by ideas which we have not looked at hitherto. And this flattery, a stable entity in the whole history of our cultures, as an eminent part of our culture, turns out to be on the, in the coral of the obscenities and, and wrongfulnesses of our culture. And in this sense, so my original question was, does she refer to Aristotle and to the Nicomachean ethic, ethics? Because when Aristotle says, there are, if you want to gain happiness, so the first way being happiness is being independent of them all, but the second is being estimated the most high by all. And uh, does she refer to Aristotle? No. Elon and Haidt do. Uh, yeah. So that they are very much yeah. aware of it. But so she knew, of course. And she, she should have and known, she, but she, I'm, I'm, so there's so. no textual evidence for yeah. it. Yeah, I see. Good. Thank you very much, Andrew.